Chan Kin Man, don't forget the lamplighters, paying respects to the initiators Chan Kin Man's final lecture at Chinese University of Hong Kong delivered on November 14, 2018 original text in Chinese having taught for more than 20 years, I feel confident at the lectern. However, today is the first time I am nervous. Just now my mind was a blank slate, I didn't know what I should say tonight as I'm very stirred up. I've seen many classmates old and new and many friends, especially comrades from Occupy Central. I am utterly thankful to you all for coming to support me, so I'm very moved. I'd like to speak a bit in Mandarin. I especially want to thank those friends who came from afar, there are maybe 7 or 8 friends who flew over from Taiwan and will have to rush home tomorrow morning for class. There's also a group of friends from the mainland, and some from Australia, who all came just for tonight. So thank you all so much. For the many who arrived tonight, aside from wanting to hear my final class, I think they also wanted to use this opportunity to express their support for the Umbrella Movement. I also take this opportunity to say, there are several Occupy organizers here who will face trial next Monday. I'd like everyone to send their regards, applause, Benny Tai, Reverend Chu Yiu Ming, Tommy Chung, Tanya Chan, Xu Ka Chun, Raphael Wang. I've walked an especially long road with Benny Tai and Reverend Chu Yiu Ming, and have vividly seen their altruism. Thank you so much. Applause, I'd like to give a special thanks to my mother-in-law. She's more than 80 years old, and she supports this movement, applause. During Occupy, I slept at Admiralty many nights. Every day, she brought me hot soup to eat, and even came to Admiralty to hand out flyers. Over 80, and most impressive of all, she didn't once complain about how much stress I was bringing to her daughter. Where there's a mother, of course there's a daughter, and this daughter is also very strong. I am immensely grateful for my wife, applause. I'm extremely grateful to be giving this speech. Bao Song gave me flowers for the first time, my students were all giving flowers for the first time. As a man, I was surprised to be receiving two bouquets for the first time. My trial begins on Monday, I'll have to go to court every day until the end of December, then I'll have to wait for the verdict. The outcome is extremely unclear because we can't see any guidelines, we don't know who will be jailed and who won't be. Under such unclear circumstances, I'd rather travel light. I don't want to create too much confusion for my classmates and my family, so I've already resigned from the university, and the university approved my early retirement on January 1, 2019. With the trial beginning soon, these are my last three days on campus, so this is a perfect time to bid everyone farewell. At the moment of my departure, I can honestly say I have no resentment and no sorrow. I can only say that today I am very moved, far more than I could have imagined. I was very calm during Occupy, this is the first time I've been comparatively stirred up. In this moment I can only feel grateful. I am utterly grateful that I could study here, that this place gave me a chance to teach countless students and contribute to society, so today I only have a thankful heart. Sobs, applause, I'd like to also express thanks for some of the books and people who inspired me. I'd like to especially share with my classmates and friends the books and people that deeply influenced me during my college years. I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to all the enlightenment they offered. In 1979, I arrived at the Chinese University of Hong Kong as a student. As I've walked such a long road, when it comes to talking about enlightening books and people, I might be leaving some things out. But every book, every person, has really all been a small lantern lighting my life, guiding me forward through the darkness one step at a time, especially on the road to fighting for democracy. When all is said and done, what were the events, people, and books that made me think that I could completely invest myself? I hope that I am able to share this with everyone. 
The initiation of social awareness golden jubilee incident the first item. While I was taking college preparatory courses, something happened in Hong Kong which became a turning point in my life. This event is known as the Golden Jubilee Incident. In front of the school gate an older student who had already graduated handed me a leaflet and said, Chan Kin Man, you're the president of the student union. Now, amid the Golden Jubilee Incident, we are going to go on strike. You need to declare your position on the matter, I said, declare my position, I'm only a secondary school student, holding a leaflet and being asked to declare my position, I totally didn't understand. It was the 70s then, it wasn't easy for people like me to enter university. At my school, the humanities track sent one student to university, and the science group sent another. If you studied hard, you were unlikely to be in the student union. Those with no chance to go to university went into the student union. I entered the student union and acted as its president, making me the least likely to test into college. I went back to campus and asked the headmaster why there was a senior student outside campus handing out leaflets about the Golden Jubilee incident and asking for my position. He said, you don't have to pay attention to this, these people are doing things to mess up Hong Kong, mess up Hong Kong, sound familiar? Audience laughs, I left and continue to ruminate. I thought, no way, we only have one person who tested into CUHK, and we only take the entrance exam for CUHK, back then nobody dared try to test into HKU. Back then we saw those who tested into university as heroes, so how could he be messing up Hong Kong? I felt uncomfortable holding that leaflet, and began to scan it. It turned out there was an assembly that Sunday in Victoria Park, so I thought, why don't I go and participate, to learn more clearly about what was going on. But how could I have the gall to participate in a political assembly? Someone of my family background, with such little guidance, I mustn't go trying to understand outside events. I didn't dare to go, but as I was looking over the paper I learned that there was a nature drawing competition. So I took my two younger brothers to my mother and said, I'll take these two to Victoria Park for the drawing competition, laughter. I settled them down on a grassy slope, set up the sketch pad, told them not to wander and to start drawing, then I ran to attend the first assembly of my life. Don't you go about criticizing me, those two later went on to study fine art and design, laughter, applause, all because of that time I initiated them, laughter. I went to sit at a Victoria Park pavilion to listen to the speeches. As I was listening I thought the people speaking on stage were making a lot of sense. At the time I really didn't know who these people were, but many years later I realized that man was Zito Wa. Not only did I not know that at the time, but at that I also didn't know that the student strike organizer was sitting right there, Professor Wang Hin Wa. Applause. He later became a professor at our university, but at that time I didn't know any of these people. I didn't sleep at all that night, why was that? I was preparing to find a job after secondary school. I felt very perplexed, I didn't know what to do. I also became aware that I couldn't judge such an incident. Why had the principal said they were messing up society, but I thought that they were making sense? They were only requesting that the school become more open and transparent, why couldn't that be? Very rarely do I suffer from insomnia, but that night my mind was turning over and over. I think that night was a turning point in my life, how would I face my life's path? I made the decision that I wanted to go to university, laughter, ah, and that decision was a very important one, laughter. I was admitted to university. One high school classmate saw my Gaokao results and said the whole class needed to put money into having my exam reviewed, laughter. He said no way that an ordinary person from the lower reaches could suddenly get so many A.S. It might be hard to believe, but the fact is I felt that I needed to study, that's how profound the Golden Jubilee was for me. 
I wanted to study sociology because I didn't understand society. But actually, I didn't know what sociology was. I felt that because I didn't understand society it would be important to study sociology. But most importantly, I felt that studying could cultivate the capacity for independent thought. This was my clear goal before I entered university. So this event had a profound and long-lasting influence on my life, I could also see that I'd been so deeply affected by this social movement that I finally chose to study social movements. The meaning of a social movement doesn't only lie in whether it can immediately change the system, but it turns out that even a bystander can be deeply impacted. Wang Hin Hua probably never knew. I want to go deeper, was it just the social movement that influenced me? No, social movements are very important, but there is another thing that is also very important, the awakening of faith. The awakening of faith, Unamuno's tragic sense of life. In high school I began to have faith. I often asked myself, what exactly am I to do in this world? How can I live a meaningful life? At that time, after I had contact with God or heaven, I felt if I walked the correct path I would have the power. Why had the Golden Jubilee incident moved me so much? It was because I'd always been mulling over one question, in the end, how should I live my life? I asked myself, I only understand one thing, painting, so I began to consider whether I should make painting my profession. I was very serious, I went down to chunking mansions where back then there weren't so many curry shops. There were lots of people there painting forgeries, that is sunsets, palm trees, those kinds of things. I asked them if they'd take me on as an apprentice, and inquired about the pay. Later, a high school teacher said that their painting had become very mechanized, that you wouldn't learn to properly paint. I was very scared because I was fond of painting. If I couldn't paint, what would I do? So I continued to feel perplexed, I began to ask myself about my own life, and began to feel that I needed to live a meaningful life. This is why I was so touched when I witnessed the Golden Jubilee incident. Many people have asked me what religion I believe in. The other two sons of Occupy are both Christians, and we've gotten along together for a long time. They've allowed me to see how religious belief is embodied in life, and so many people think that I too am Christian. But once, a few mainland friends made a special trip to bring me a Buddhist rosary, because they saw that when I was first arrested I brought a Buddhist scripture with me into the police station. In fact, it was the biography of Master Hong Yi. Am I a Christian? Students have asked me this for many years, and I usually don't answer. I can only say, I am a person who has faith but has no religion. Why say that? As I've said, religious questions are very important to me, they make me sensitive to society. When I entered university, I felt that first I'd deal with these religious questions. I couldn't stop thinking. Every time I went to church by bus, I'd forget to get off in time and would have to turn around. Because I was often pondering religious questions, especially when I started to study philosophy, my minor was philosophy, many rational problems often perplexed me. Say, for example, does God exist? Can you negate or prove this? What is sin? If the snake in the Garden of Eden was also God's creation, what is the nature of sin? If the Bible says so, is that really sin? When all is said and done, do we have free will? If some people say you have sin because you have free will, does free will contradict God's omnipotence and omniscience? These are all questions us philosophy people will bump into. I unceasingly racked my brain. Studying sociology was very clear, I knew that people from different cultures had different opportunities to come into contact with Christianity, even within the same society, different communities' opportunities to come in contact aren't the same. Within different cultures' different religions, there are the same miracles and marvels, likewise, many people are inspired by their religions to practice righteousness and pity for the world. This is not limited to Christianity. 
My mind has endlessly struggled with these questions, I could ruminate over this for a whole day and still not reach any conclusions, and I'd be unable to take action. In my first and second years in university, I reflected on many of these types of questions, and read incessantly. This eventually allowed me to come upon some books which deeply, deeply influenced my life. The first book is The Tragic Sense of Life by Unamuno. While preparing to deliver this lecture, I sought out this book that so deeply affected me while in university. Decades later, I still keep it by my side. I also remember that after I finished reading this book, one concluded three things. I attempted to use many methods to understand my faith, and finally this book told me that human reason is quite limited, some experiences are very profound, for example religious experience, but if you want to prove it or attempt to tell others about it, you find you can't, even from a very philosophical point of view. If you try to use reason to verify, many times it doesn't work. So my first lesson, which I wrote in the margins of that book, was, people think that faith is not enough to make us self-sufficient, so they seek reason, but reason conversely rejects faith. This is the opinion that I wrote in that book's margin back then. The second item is very difficult for many people to accept, but for me in the end was easy to grasp. I often say, and this book also said, I believe in such and such, but that actually means, I long for such and such, you say you believe in something, but it's hard to find a rational basis for this, what it more deeply reflects is in fact that I very much, hope to believe in something, that you, want, to believe something. Unamuno said that the nature of belief is actually a question of will, and not a question of reason. Why do we long for God? It's because humanity suffers hardship, we see that beautiful things are transient. Perhaps you saw a loved one suddenly depart from this world, and you want to meet them again. You see that in this world righteousness is sometimes not obtained or upheld. Some of that which you long for, you long for eternally, and that longing for something else is also possible, longing for a next life, longing for heaven, but that actually is a reflection of suffering in this world, hence there is longing. For the past many years I haven't told students that, in my opinion, I believe, is actually, I hope, you hope to see it, that's it. The third item I learned about religious attitude and form came from one sentence in this book, and moved me greatly. Unamuno said, some people sit inside a church as a formality, with their thoughts wandering, dozing off or whatever. Other people kneel in heresy before an idol and confess. Theologian Unamuno said, actually, the former are worshipping an idol, while the latter are worshipping God. According to him, the outer appearance of a religion isn't important, what is important is attitude. This wording deeply moved me as a sociology student, and as a result I started saying I am, a person of faith but without a religion, perhaps for many this style of faith is very uncertain, but for me it sets my mind at ease. If you tell me an absolute truth, sorry, it would make me feel quite uncomfortable, but if you tell me, actually we are very uncertain, what is known is very small, we are very insignificant, using these kinds of phrases, it sets me at ease. So I am very thankful that in my first year of university I came across this book. The second book that deeply affected my religiosity was Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison. I remember the type of bookstore I was at back then. I often bought books like this to read. The more I went the more depressed I'd feel, repeatedly seeing that religious language as I flipped through the pages, until I accidentally bought Letters and Papers from Prison. The initiation of religious belief Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison Bonhoeffer was a German chaplain around the time of World War II. He was entirely different from the rest of the German church, which at that time stood on Hitler's side. Basically only him and a small group confronted the rest of the church. This was the question that his work dealt with, Christians must invest in the world to practice their faith. The church must renounce its own comfort and privilege and dare to practice values that differ from the world, and stand with those people suffering hardship. This left a deep impression upon me. Could the church really dare to be different from the mainstream values of society? 
I felt that no, it couldn't. I saw the church of this day and age, and it was very much in line with the mainstream social values. Bonhoeffer often asked a question, at this time and place, who is Jesus? That is, if Junius Ho was Christian, he would say, kill, don't pardon, and there was Benny Tai, another Christian, Bonhoeffer would ask. If Jesus were on this earth, which of the two is Jesus? Is it Junius Ho, or is it Benny Tai? He often asked these kinds of questions, hoping that faith isn't an abstract thing. One had to take a practical view in questioning the meaning of faith. With so many people before us, who can live like Jesus? His religious outlook is that he doesn't accept that the world and the spiritual are entirely separate, that you can gaze at heaven while not looking at the ground. Every Christian must be fully human by bringing God into his whole life, not merely into some spiritual realm. It's a shame that Bonhoeffer died after he finished writing letters and papers from prison. The outline of everything he wanted to write next is in this book, and it's been a great inspiration to me, but he never got to flesh out those ideas. After Occupy Central, after we'd been arrested and began awaiting trial, Raphael Wong and I had a heart to heart. He'd been in prison before, he knew what it was like. He said you can bring six books with you to prison, so I made haste and ordered some books, laughter. Intellectuals are so annoying, our first question is, can we read in jail? We can, so I ordered a pile of books to read in prison. The first book one ordered was Bonhoeffer's biography, Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy, by Eric Metaxas, but two months later I still haven't gone to prison and I've already read the entire 600-page book, Laughter. Now I have to order one more book. I have to really think about which one to get. I felt the most urgency to read that first book because, when I was at university, the one thing from Bonhoeffer's letters and papers from prison that influenced me the most, the one that's always stuck with me, is this, I want a true church, not, I want a true election, laughter. He believed that the German church stood on the wrong side of history, that standing with Hitler was totally wrong. How could this be, you ask? That's how it was back then. The mainstream German church was entirely on Hitler's side. Bonhoeffer said, if you board the wrong train, it is no use running along the corridor in the other direction, boarding the wrong train is a disaster. He would rather break from the church and make a new spiritual community. He often asked what the true church was. Faith is not just about the physical church, the rituals, the pastors, and so on. He believed the crux of the true church at the time was the Jewish question, do you stand with the Jews? When the Jews are persecuted, what does the Christian church have to say? In his interpretation, even though the Jews do not believe in Jesus, they surely don't believe in Jesus, they consider him to be just a prophet and not the son of God, they are still a part of the church. If you can't protect the Jews within this space, then you fundamentally cannot practice faith in the present sense. This was the most important test of the church. You can imagine the rift between Bonhoeffer and the church. Read more about Bonhoeffer's stance on the church and the Jewish question from the Holocaust Museum, as characterized in the book, Bonhoeffer practiced what he preached to the very end. He was even involved in a plot to assassinate Hitler. Shouldn't the pastor have stood for love and peace like Chu Yiu Ming? Laughter, typical lefties, Bonhoeffer even went on to be a double agent, plotting the assassination with first-class military officers while helping the secret police spy on the church at the same time. This actually protected him from arrest and allowed him to continue his underground work. He would even endure humiliation, because he believed that God had called on him to kill Hitler. Just try to imagine a pastor like this. One of Hitler's generals plotted the assassination with them. They planned to bomb one of Hitler's meetings, and that officer planted the bomb in the meeting room. Many people died, but Hitler was unscathed, because two large iron plates stood on either side of his desk. 
press conference that afternoon, Hitler said he couldn't be blown up because God had chosen him, then the German church issued a statement indicating that Hitler was indeed chosen by God. You can just imagine the church stooping to this level. Today no one blinks at the direction the church is moving in. The church can be breathtakingly wrong. Bonhoeffer was tough. If I were him, I would have been disheartened, I admire him. When such a demon survived the bombing, Bonhoeffer still had faith. I think that if they had killed Hitler, we would have only had a Hitler number two, because the Nazi party had not yet lost its power. The Nazis would have called it a conspiracy against them, and would have installed another Hitler. Friends, time is not something we can hold on to. We can only do what we think is right, just as Nazism was only truly destroyed after Nazi Germany was defeated, and that extreme German nationalism destroyed along with it. For everything there is a season. So don't just think, why hasn't our action borne fruit? Why are those bad eggs still in power? For everything there is a season. Before Germany lost the war, Hitler sent Bonhoeffer to the gallows, and just before the execution he said, this is the end, as I see it, the beginning of life. A doctor in the prison at the time said he had never met anyone with so much faith in God, and an American prisoner of war said the most morally upright person he had ever met in his life was none other than Bonhoeffer. That's the person Bonhoeffer was, his whole life asking what is worthy of being called the church. In the end he even proposed the concept of religionless Christianity, that is, if I don't have a religion, can I still have Christian faith? These books had a profound impact on me. I feel very uncomfortable at church. Many of the people I see there keep their faith in a tiny box. They think if they don't do well on exams they should ask God, if they're jilted they should ask God. But when it comes to society, to history, they never think God has any role in these. The way the church squeezes faith into the crevice of the personal, it makes me very, very uncomfortable. It directly conflicts with how I think faith should be practiced. So when I read Bonhoeffer, I felt like I'd found a voice in the church that I could stand behind. I remember I once in church went before the pastor after he had given his sermon and asked him, Pastor, in today's sermon you ran yourself ragged talking about the Trinity and so on, but why? I'm telling you, so many people are asleep, in such sweet sleep. Why do you go on about this all the time? Can't you talk about anything related to our lives, to our society? He brought me to the pulpit and wrote a note right there that said we can only spread the purest truth, I say, if that is the purest truth, I'd rather not hear it. I believe that faith needs vitality. So when I encountered Bonhoeffer's writing, it really touched me. Two pastors who brought faith and community together at that time there were two pastors in Hong Kong whose sermons also touched me. One was Reverend Lo Lung Kuang, the other was Reverend Chu Yi Yu Ming. I listened to their sermons during my university years, listened to how they put faith into practice in the community. They were both in Chai Wan. At that time Hong Kong Island was the poorest district, home to many squatters living in shacks. Practiced their faith in that neighborhood. Those two really touched me. Reverend Lo Lung Kuang and Reverend Chu Yi Yu Ming also had a deep impact on me. My first job out of university was at Reverend Lo's community center. I remember at the job interview he asked whether I was a Christian. Everyone at his center was a Christian. I said, in my view a Christian is a humanitarian. Does that work for you? Laughter, the reverend replied, okay la audience erupts into laughter, and hired me. I was the only so-called Christian working there who hadn't returned to the church. I answered with Bonhoeffer's response, that